Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us uh, today. Uh, the, my name is Stephen Aquario. I'm the Executive Director of the New York State Association of Counties. And today's session uh, is about uh, PFAS and your local landfill managing risk and preparing for regulations. I, I really appreciate the uh, the fact that all of you have, have joined us and, and taken some time out of what always is a very busy a busy day. Uh, we have over uh, 30 counties participating in this webinar, uh, likely over 100 people. Uh, very important uh, that, that everyone joined us here today. We also have a number of state agencies that are with us as well. Uh, PFAS, as you may know by now, is very much of an emerging contaminant that many of you have heard of in relationship to drinking water. And we've heard a lot about that uh, in the newspapers, in the headlines, state agency regulations, drinking water council. We've heard about firefighting foam, but it's not very often discussed in relation to landfills. This webinar today is intended to educate local government officials about the risks of PFAS in landfills, how to manage it, what regulations may be on the horizon. And lastly, we'll hear from an attorney who's dedicated many, many years of addressing this issue, not just in New York State, but around the country, and the leader in fighting for justice in this area of PFAS. We're joined today by Richard Bills also, who's an environmental project coordinator for the great county of Steuben and is the president of the New York State Association for Solid Waste Management. Rich will provide a, a very deep dive into the dangers associated with PFAS, the emerging regulations promulgated by the state and how this may impact operations at landfills and importantly, wastewater treatment facilities. Our final speaker today will be Paul Napoli, Counselor at Law from Napoli Skolnick. Paul will describe the current landscape of federal, state, and local litigation. And as I mentioned, he is an expert in this subject matter. But before I turn it over to Rich, I wanted to first provide a few brief introductory slides to PFAS and the regulations under consideration by the State of New York. So PFAS, what are they? Where are they found? What are the regulations that are at issue here? In the federal government, in New York State, and in other states around the country. So PFAS in landfills, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or this chemical family known as PFAS, are a group of man-made chemicals that includes PFOA and PFOS. They were manufactured and used in a variety of United States as well as global industries in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, all the way up through the 2000s. As has been widely reported, the half-life of these chemicals, very long, they do not break down. Instead, they bioaccumulate in the environment and in our bodies over time. The exposure to PFAS has been led, studied extensively in animals, and it has been linked to adverse health effects. So too are those same concerns for human health effects. And this chart that you're seeing on this slide talks about the various channels with which this family of PFAS chemicals comes into contact with human beings, paints, shampoos, nonstick cookware, stain resistant photography, Mr. Napoli later, fast food packaging, pesticides, the list and just about everything in society. 
This slide talks about how the exposure comes in contact with human beings and human exposure. Consumer products going into landfills and the waste infrastructure ending up exposing human beings. Industry, firefighting foam, the environment, air, soil, all interacting through the waste infrastructure one way or another as this forever chemical never goes away, ultimately impacting human beings, animals, and transferring to infants through breast milk and cord blood. Some concerns for landfills are that landfills receive PFAS and wastes, and it's discharged in leachate. PFAS have been found in leachate at levels above drinking water standards and guidelines. PSAF have been found in ground, groundwater monitoring wells located near landfills. And importantly, as you'll hear, from Mr. Napoli at the conclusion of this session, the cost for sampling, the analysis, and leachate management are costly, and the efforts to remediate these contaminants could prove to be very expensive. The illustration on the right of this slide talks about the life cycle of PFAS. PFAS is a very important emerging contaminant for all of us to be concerned about. It's important to pay attention to. It's a forever chemical that never goes away, but the good news is it can be removed from the environment through technology and systems that we have available, but it is costly and the ongoing maintenance costs that are associated with this can be very costly and occur over a, a long life cycle, 50 years or so. So landfills and water waste, we need to be vigilant to protect our environment. PFAS, PFAS regulations in New York State, thankfully, under the leadership of Governor Andrew Cuomo, our state was the first state to list PFOA as a hazardous substance. And our state, as a leader in this area, under the leadership of Governor Cuomo, has followed through with regulation of PFOA and PFOS. In December of 2018, the Drinking Water Quality Council proposed MCLs of 10 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS and one for dioxane. This is sevenfold below the current United States EPA Lifetime Health Advisory of 70 parts per trillion. MCLs are enforceable standards. MCLs require water suppliers to test and report results. And if the MCL is exceeded, supply must, must take steps to reduce the concentration and notify customers. Public supplies will be required to begin monitoring within 60 days of publication of the final regulation. At the federal level, we're not doing so well. There is no maximum contaminant level for drinking water, for soil, for air. We have a lifetime health advisory of 70 parts per trillion, which is exactly the opposite direction that the states are going in. If there's one takeaway from this webinar today, it's this comment. My concern is New York officials at the local government level. In New York and around the country, my concern is too many people are relying on the United States EPA local health advisory at 70 parts per trillion, thinking that we are under that threshold or we're not at that threshold and our environment is safe our infrastructure is safe, our, our soil, our drinking water, our surface water, our groundwater is safe. 
if it doesn't exceed 70 parts per trillion. PFOS and PFOA are included on the contaminant candidate list at the federal level. And then importantly and lastly on this slide, the US EPA has awarded recently $6 million to the State Department of Health to study landfills as a source of PFAS groundwater contamination. And that recently took place in September of 2019. So the last slide I wanted to show is this is not unique to New York. And as you'll hear from Councillor Napoli, it's, it's, it's affecting all states across the country, but these states are actively engaged in this issue. And of course, our state being a leader under the leadership of Governor Andrew M. Cuomo and the commissioners of health and the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation showing the proposed MCL at 10 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS, as well as 1,4-dioxane in the state of New Jersey. You could see the thresholds that are in place for groundwater in Vermont, half the level of the state of New York. In New Hampshire, 12 points per trillion and 15 parts per trillion, in Michigan at eight parts per trillion, in Massachusetts, a proposal at 20 parts per trillion, and what's not on this chart, I believe, is the state of California at five parts per trillion. Clearly, the states moving to regulate in this space, and very importantly, be in a position to act when the United States EPA appears to not be acting. So that will conclude my open, uh, open uh, introductory comments. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Rich Bills from Steuben, Steuben County Solid Waste, as well as the president of the New York State Association for Solid Waste Management. Rich, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Um, right. Yeah, so Thank welcome, you. welcome to PFOS and the Landfill Operator. Um, my name is Rich Bills, Environmental Project Coordinator at Steuben County, as well as President of the New York State Association of Solid Waste Management. Um, very briefly, uh, my background, I operate um, Steuben County's leachate pretreatment facility. I've been involved with the landfill operation, uh, compliance, and all, t all different aspects for over 10 years. Um, as far as my involvement with NYSISWAM, I'm routinely in communication with uh, different landfill operators, people who are involved with solid waste management throughout the state. And I can tell you that um, the things that we are seeing in Steuben County, as far as these PFAS, um, are very similar to the things that people are seeing all throughout the state. Um, I'm primarily going to be talking to landfill operator today and the municipality who may have post-closure responsibilities for a closed landfill, but maybe has been out of the, the active landfill business in New York State for many years. All right, slide. So the basics. Um, I'll refer to these things as emerging contaminants throughout uh, the rest of this presentation. I'll alternate probably between PFAS and emerging contaminants. Now, emerging contaminants, um, they're currently, these are the emerging contaminants, the PFAS and the 1,4-dioxane. Um, after we address these things, I assume they'll become just regular contaminants, um, and we'll have something else to worry about in a few years. But right now, these are what we're looking at. Um, where are they coming from? Uh, PFAS have been manufactured by 3M and DuPont in the past. Uh, manufacture has been phased out in the United States between 2010, 2015, or before, um, but they're still produced overseas. Um, they've been used in ingredients in things like Teflon, Scotchgard, um, waterproof clothing, things like that. Very common consumer use products. 1,4-dioxane, I'm going to kind of breeze through 
the 1,4-dioxane stuff. It's a solvent stabilizer, and it is used in some consumer products. Um, why are we worrying about these things right now? Why are, why are these things the situation? Well, they've been linked with negative health effects, cancer, birth defects, and the levels that um, are, are of concern, they're in debate, but um, the levels are very, very low, parts per trillion. And later in this thing, I will, I will point out what a part per trillion or a few parts per trillion amounts to. It um, previously was not really detectable. And additionally, these chemicals are very resistant to breakdown in the environment, like Steve had mentioned. Um, they persist. They're, they're designed in a lab specifically not to break down, and so they don't. They continue to um, move around throughout our environment. Okay, slide. All right, so the no conversation I ever get into um, finishes off without me talking about this movie. If anyone's seen The Devil We Know, it's a, a Netflix documentary. It's a documentary you can get on Netflix. Um, that talks about the town of Parkersburg, West Virginia, um, which was home to a DuPont manufacturing facility that produced Teflon for many, many years. Um, in the movie, they talk about Teflon. Teflon contained a chemical that they, they refer to as C8, which is a PFAS. Um, and uh, it goes through a lot of the health effects that the people who work at the facility are, are dealing with and uh, some of the, the potential cover-up stuff. I'm not gonna go through that, um, but there was an impactful part of that movie that I always like to tell people about that kind of explains some of the, some of the way this stuff is, the, just, just the scope of what we're talking about today. Um, they were talking about testing the employees' blood, um, the employees in the plant after they started having health issues. And they tested the employees' blood and they found that it was in there. Um, so in order to compare, they needed a control. They needed, they needed to find some blood from someone else who didn't work in the plant so they could see what the differences were. So they went out and they started looking for blood from children, um, adults, um, people in countries as far away as Asia, and they were unable to find, did not have, as a matter of fact, uh, when they eventually did find a sample of some blood that they could use to compare, they were from a group of uh, Korean War veterans, um, guys, uh, guys who had gone off to war in the, before the Korean War, um, and that blood was taken before that this chemical became prevalent in the environment. So that's that's kind of the extent of of how far these chemicals have spread throughout our environment. Um, I think that <clears throat> usually drives it home for me. All right, slide. So what are the PFAS? Steve already went through this, but I'll talk about it a little bit as well. Um, these are common um, things that are in, in, available in American households. Um, things like nonstick cookware, uh, stain-resistant furniture and carpets, um, wrinkle-free and water-repellent clothing, cosmetics, uh, pizza boxes, popcorn bags, fast food wrappers, okay? So we're worrying about this stuff in the landfill right now, and we should be. But we're cooking our food in pans, potentially, that, 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 it's, that it's available in. We're buying pizza in it. We're wearing it on our clothes. We're sitting on it on our couch. Okay. Um, they are, this, this stuff is all over the place. Slide. 1,4-dioxane, uh, um, I, like I said, I won't get into this too much. But it turns out that this stuff is usually found with um, spills. Uh, plumes of um, solvent contamination, things like that. There are some fairly high, uh, high scale spills throughout the state, I think, that, that people are aware of that um, this is an issue for. Um, it's also used in some consumer products as well. Okay, slide. All right, this next slide, I think this, as I was looking forward, I think this shows up in. Uh, the next presentation as well. So I'm not going to I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it, but um, it is important to understand the cycle of how these chemicals move through our environment. All right, um, right at the top of the page, you're going to see a landfill, and uh, it has PFAS coming into it, PFAS going out of it, PFAS coming back into it. 
Um, you've got PFAS producing factories. You've got um, farm fields. You've got wastewater treatment plants um, and residential homes. And because these chemicals don't disappear, once they get in the environment, they cycle around. They come into the landfill. They leave the landfill. They go to the wastewater treatment plant. They leave the wastewater treatment plant. And then they'll eventually end up potentially getting into everything. And that seems to be where we're at today. Okay, slide, please. All right, so every New Yorker has a fundamental right to clean and safe drinking water. Um, in 2016, Governor Cuomo launched a statewide drinking water quality initiative. Um, under ECL Article 27, Title 12, they directed um, the, the DEC and the Department of Health to identify and prioritize solid waste sites that are imp impacting drinking water sources. Okay. Um, there's a couple different types of sites that we're going to talk about, and I'm going to try to get into the detail of these. Um, next slide. Okay. Yep. And this is this is how this stuff is all happening. Um, you know, I I know from from our perspective, we started receiving letters um, saying that the state wanted to come in and look at the PFAS around our landfills and all the different uh, things, and we were like, why is this happening? And I only recently realized that. This was, this was a concerted effort across the state to clean up drinking water, um, and it's a good thing. We need clean drinking water, okay? We need to make sure that the people in the state have clean drinking water, and these chemicals are newly um, being understood to be what they are, and uh, this is where this stuff is coming from. Okay, next slide. All right, so the first type of site I want to talk about is a solid waste site. Um, these are what you might refer to as dumps, okay? Inactive closed landfills. Um, we had one close to us that uh, was just one of those sites that that the local old timers knew about. They would, um, you know, say, "Oh, there used to be a dump over here and this stuff." And I know that site got looked at as part of this part of this thing. There are approximately 1,800 in the state, so they are all over the place. Um, there's probably a number of them in every single county in the state. Um, some of these things were illegal disposal sites. Um, some of them were inactive solid waste management facilities that had no active monitoring program in place. Um, this does not include facilities regulated under the Division of Environmental Remediation. Uh, those are a separate beast, which I will talk about here shortly. Um, slide. <clears throat> the inactive landfill initiative so the Division of Materials Management is handling these, along with the Department of Health. They have a shared responsibility to prioritize these sites. Um, the typical process that they're following, DC project manager will contact an owner for permission to conduct an inspection, okay? They have authority to do so. So you may have gotten a, a letter that sounds scary. You know, I know we received one as well, and we're like, what's going on? But um, just an inspection. The DEC or their consultant would perform a site inspection, um, and I'll show you the form that we're using next. Um, after the site inspection, further investigation may include sampling of, of leachates, groundwater, surface water, and surrounding drinking water supply wells for these emerging contaminants. Um, they generate a priority list of solid waste sites, and this was completed, uh, was supposed to be completed by July 2019. Okay, and I think this thing continues uh, annually as different things happen. Okay, slide, please. Um, so next slide is going to show you the scorecard. This is just a page of, I think, a five-page document that uh, um, the inspectors were using to, to classify the site. Um, they look at things such as landfill characteristics, proximity to receptors, geologic setting, current conditions, um, is the site in good shape? Is it being maintained? Is, are there, is there leachate pouring out in the ditch? Um, are there different, um, is there a history of problems at the site or no? Um, and so the score that is determined from this uh, inspection would maybe clear the, this site from further investigation and this, they may decide that this was not a site that needed further um, testing or anything further, and then if that's the case, then you're good. Um, if you scored high enough, then you might be considered to be a threat to 
to the drinking water. And because of what they're out looking to do is to try to clean up drinking water, um, they would uh, potentially move you into the next step, which would be further investigation. Okay. Um, and I will talk a little bit further more about the uh, further investigations here next. So next slide. Um, the next type of site uh, in this group are inactive hazardous waste landfills. Um, the Division of Environmental Remediation seems to be handling these along with the Department of Health. Um, these are sites that, under, that are under remedial programs. Um, the state has uh, oversight over them and we are usually uh, actively monitoring them, um, sending reports to the state. They have control over these sites. Okay. Um, in our county, we have, I believe, three, at least three of these sites that fall under this particular um, heading. So the typical process that you're going to come into, uh, they will request a monitoring work plan to be completed uh, for their review. Um, the work plan will require a systematic approach to checking um, the surrounding groundwater for one of these sites um, for these emerging contaminants, the PFAS and the 1,4-dioxane. Um, you're talking about um, proper sample methodology, um, qualified laboratories, data validation, final summary report, which you will then send to the DEC. They will take a look at it, um, review it, and you will be paying for all these things. Okay, at least that's the way I've seen it and heard about it happening for people in our situation. Um, if the results indicate exceedances of the current proposed MCLs, the maximum contaminant levels, further action may be required. Okay, um, we're going to end up kind of at a spot where I don't know what happens uh, much past this. Um, depending on your region, the next phase may vary. All right, they may perform a half mile drinking water supply survey um, to see who's in your area. They may uh, require resampling of the exceedances, okay? Or you may perform additional sampling um, on site and off site. So I know it is uh, has happened throughout the state where uh, ground groundwater wells surrounding one of these landfills has shown to have a, uh, a level of one of these contaminants above the MCL, and uh, the state would then require that they expand the sampling to potentially include um, neighboring uh, groundwater, groundwater wells. Um, at that point, once somebody has um, maybe determined that this stuff is spread into a, another groundwater well, where someone might be using that as drinking water, um, I'm not quite sure exactly what happens at that point. I assume that um, we're going to be dealing with cleaning up drinking water for those particular sites and probably expanding the, um, uh, the investigation to make sure that we know what the extent of it is. So those types of things um, are very much possibilities. All right, next slide. Operational landfills. So DEC did testing in 2018, uh, early in the spring of 2018, where they tested, from what I understand, basically all of the um, active landfills in the state, or most of them anyway. Um, sampling was completed by the DEC. Um, owners, uh, such as ourselves, were allowed to collect split samples. So if you wanted to make sure that um, you had your own set of analytical results, you could do that. Um, they were analyzed for PFAS and the 1,4-dioxane. Um, when they came in and sampled, they looked at older portions of the landfill, they looked at newer portions of the landfill, um, composite samples. And um, the concept behind this, from what I understand, was for the state to gather up a data set so that they could identify what they were dealing with. All right, you have to identify what you're dealing with before you go about trying to solve problems or clean things up or anything like that. So they uh, went out and gathered up a bunch of data. Um, to my knowledge right now, um, landfill operators could request that data um, from the DEC that they got. And um, I've also not seen any kind of a summary from the DEC or any kind of a release of the, the totality of all that data. Um, so it's to some extent unknown. Uh, next slide. Um, this, this is the last little section here. Operational landfills, 
Um, the new Part 360s require that um, these emerging contaminants are sampled within the expanded parameter list. Um, recent requests have sought to amend EMPs to include trigger values for emerging contaminants uh, for site groundwater monitoring network. And the idea basically is to establish a database, um, you know, and make sure that we know what, what the groundwater looks like before a landfill is, is constructed. Next slide. All right, so we're talking a lot about um, a lot of testing and, and a lot of these things are done by consulting engineers and they require expensive laboratory uh, work to be done. It's pricey. Um, I know what we pay is similar to what a lot of people pay. Um, it's about $330 a sample um, just for the analytical. Um, sampling costs are particularly high as well because you just don't run out there and grab a, a, a cup full of water and send it to the lab. There's this, there's this procedure in the next slide that I'll, that I'll show you that uh, seems kind of ridiculous. Um, and it's an unexpected hit to a lot of people's budgets. Um, some, some facilities, from what I've heard, are in the range of doubling their, their projected monitoring budget, okay? Um, it's a significant deal. Um, and that, that type of cost may be related to the number of sites that you're managing. If you have a, a, a number of closed sites, and you've got um, uh, a lot of samples to take care of, and you're, you've got a lot of reporting to do, and all this stuff, it, it, it can add up. It's an expensive, it's an expensive deal for us. All right, next slide. Um, here's, a, here's the sampling protocol. This is one, I know there's multiple sampling protocols. They all basically look the same. Um, and you can read through this if you want, but some of the things that, caught my, that catch my eye, which I find to be interesting, uh, fabric softener. You must avoid wearing clothes that have been washed with fabric softener within like the last five five washes. Um, no waterproof clothing. So if you're wandering the landfill grabbing samples, uh, no waterproof clothing, which is, you know, that pretty much puts every water sampler out of business that, I, that I've ever met. Um, no food packaging, all right, because this stuff is in food packaging uh, in the area and sunscreen, okay? So these are the types of things that could potentially contaminate a sample. Um, so your, your, your sampler is going to end up having to go through this whole procedure to uh, keep themselves clean of all these different potential contaminants. Because we're looking at things like parts of the trillion level situation. All right, next slide. <clears throat> In July 2019, New York State adopted uh, one of the strictest standards in the nation for these things. And they created they adopted the MCLs, the maximum contaminant levels. Um, Steve mentioned that this allows for some, um, uh, a lot of different things to happen for them to start enforcing these levels on, on groundwaters and drinking waters and things like that. Um, next slide. Uh, and as Steve also pointed out, the EPA looks at the PFAS and the, and the PFAS um, they're talking 70 parts per trillion. New York State's looking at 10 parts per trillion. 1,4-dioxane, uh, they're looking at 35 parts per billion. New York State's looking at one part per billion. So it's clear that New York State is leading the way or making their best effort to lead the way to make sure that the, the clean drinking water is available to the people in the state, um, which I don't see how anybody could have any issues with. Um, how we get there, that's going to be... That's going to be what's fun, I guess. Um, next slide. So I've been talking parts per trillion, and uh, the levels that this, these chemicals, these PFAS, are con considered to be potentially toxic. Um, what's a part per trillion? All right. Um, it's equivalent to one grain of sand in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. All right. It's one tenth of a cent in a billion dollars. It's less than one second of a 78-year uh, person's lifespan, okay? If a person drinks 64 ounces of water a day for 78 years, and the water is uh, a 10 part per trillion containing uh, water, the person would have drunk less than a drop of these PFAS, okay? So that's the level of craziness that we're talking about here. That's um, normally when you're dealing with contaminants at, at, and drinking water and landfill stuff, you're talking um, parts per million, maybe parts per billion, but uh, this is new. All right, next slide. 
So landfills generate leachate. That's the way the contaminated water that, that hits the landfill, um, uh, that's what happens to it. It turns into leachate. Um, some facilities have their own pretreatment facility, which will um, pretreat the leachate. It'll, it'll remove a lot of the contamination from it, and then it eventually goes to a wastewater treatment plant, usually a local one, um, because hauling water all around the state gets expensive. Um, wastewater treatment plants are, I believe, on the radar for similar type investigations. I mean, if the state's looking at uh, getting into um, cleaning up the drinking water. I mean, they're going to have to look at these these sites as well. Um, when they test at these sites, they're discharging water directly back to the waterways. I, I imagine there will be going to be there will be a quicker response time uh, that's required. Okay, and what are these wastewater treatment plants going to do if they, um, you know? do a round of testing and they find out that there are uh, PFAS in the water that they're accepting and um, sending back out in the environment. Are they going to start to reject landfill leachates? Um, are they going to start to look at their significant industrial users and start questioning things? Are they going to raise prices? Um, those are all question marks. Uh, people don't know exactly what's going to happen right now. Um, as far as treatment technologies, the two that I hear a lot are reverse osmosis, and uh, granulated activated carbon, their treatment technologies to the extent that they're separation technologies. So if you're running a, an RO system or uh, activated carbon, you may be able to pull these PFAS out of the water. Um, now they're in a solid, they're in a sludge, they're in a slurry, they're in some sort of a, a separate waste stream, okay? Where are they gonna go? Are they gonna go back into your landfill? Are they gonna go um, to a special treatment plant that's very expensive. Um, these chemicals are designed not to be easily destroyed. Um, so um, that's a question mark, absolutely a question mark. Um, also, wastewater treatment plants have, have another issue to worry about if they're pulling some of these things out in their, um, in their sludges. They have the risk of uh, potentially um, being involved with land spread operations. Um, you know, where these things get spread onto farmers' fields. And if you go back to that, that cycle slide that I talked about earlier, you'll see how that's a potential for things to spread quite far. Okay, next slide. All right, so uh, a colleague of mine sent, sent this to me last week, um, and it's uh, kind of a concerning article. It's from the Boston Globe, and uh, it talks about um, a low water treatment plant that's uh, decide to stop accepting landfill leachate from a New, New Hampshire landfill. Um, it is a concern that this type of thing happens more often, um, particularly with articles that are written like this one. Um, I'm sure you can find it if you go looking for it. Uh, next slide. But um, the leachate that we generate very likely is going to have levels of PFAS that are above um, what the state has set as a maximum contaminant level. Um, and uh, these water treatment plants are going to be faced with the decision about what they do. At some point, it's almost seeming inevitable that they will start looking at their water as well, and they'll see that uh, maybe some of this stuff's coming from the landfill. Do they really want to be taking leachate from the landfill anymore? Okay, or do they, are they going to do something different? Do they have to do a, a modification of their plant? Okay, so these are questions um, that I think are starting to get asked, as you can see from this article. Uh, next slide. So the la uh, one of the last things here, last two slides, um, public perception. So New York State landfills are, um, I would say, the best in the in the country, um, in my opinion. I love doing a landfill tour, and I love to show people who uh, have never been to a landfill how um, how tight they are, how how well designed they are, how safe the drinking water is, and um, and and all the reasons that we know that. And so I think we're starting to build some kind of a level of of uh, understanding amongst the public that that's the way landfills are these days. And I'm concerned that, especially when you get articles written by people who um, 
may like to, you know, look at this as maybe some sort of a clickbait opportunity. Um, they can make this seem like something that maybe the landfill operators aren't doing something right or something along the lines of that. So what are we going to do about it? Um, first, take I like to do the spill analogy. Basically, if you have a spill um, and you're, you're, you have to clean it up, right? And I, you can imagine that we're, we're basically looking at, at, a, at a spill here. Um, the first thing you have to do before you start cleaning things up is you need to stop the flow, okay? We need to work to educate consumers and I think advocate for elimination of these compounds in the everyday products that we're using, okay? We need to get these things to slow down and stop coming into landfills before we can hope to do anything on the back end about it. Um, landfill operators and post-closure caretakers, you might be someone who's in a county who's only got uh, a closed landfill these days. Um, there are, we're not bad actors in these situations, okay? These are not chemicals that we knew we shouldn't have taken. You know, these are chemicals that can legally come into the landfill today and do all around the, all around the country. Um, so I'm concerned that, that landfill operators would end up with a bad rap out of this. And I don't think it's, I don't think it would be um, uh, justified. Um, there's going to be potential for some significant grant money, I think, to help out. I hope the state, um, I know as far as part of uh, the governor's initiative, I know there's a lot of money involved, so that's good. That also requires that municipals usually uh, get involved with, with their share. Usually state grants are not 100% funding. Um, we need to work to be upfront and work towards solutions, okay? I think we all understand that these things are in our leachate. They're, they're, if they're in the environment around our facilities, we need to work towards solving those problems, okay? Not hide from them, not uh, point fingers at people, work to get things done, okay? Because water quality is an important issue in the state, and I think we are in a particularly unique position to help. So that's all I got. Thank you. Uh, both state agencies were present at this UA, U.S. EPA summit, and then and now we continue to ask the federal government to designate uh, PFAS as a hazardous substance, which would trigger uh, Superfund uh, federal Superfund funding right now because of the state classification. We are able to use it for state Superfund purposes, but for federal purposes, we are not. So we continue to urge our congressional delegation, and we have been working on this for the past five years. But it indeed has a statewide impact, whether you're in Long Island or uh, in Niagara Falls and Erie. Our state is a very industrial state and has a legacy of industrial purposes. Uh, we have uh, this contaminant uh, emerging, as Rich has talked about, in various corners Can of the state. Can you hear me, Steve? I, I can, Paul. Yes, I can. Just a minute. Um, and Mr. Napoli uh, has been working on this issue uh, in New York State at the local government level, uh, coordinating with the state of New York as well. Uh, there is a major federal lawsuit, which uh, Paul Napoli will talk about in a minute during his presentation, about the growing importance uh, of this issue and its impact on local governments. We've seen it in manufacturing. As Rich has talked about, we've seen it in firefighting of foams, which Mr. Napoli will talk about, and we're seeing it coming emerging around landfills. All three areas impacting drinking water 
uh, groundwater surface water. So to test for these contaminants, the investigations surrounding these environmental investigations, the engineering costs, the public relations, and the communications to the public reporting, uh, all of this is expensive, timely, and very consuming work. Uh, I'd like to introduce you now to Paul Napoli, who's been working with water districts and other, uh, and other public sector entities that are complementing the great work of the state of New York to address this issue. And so let's turn the presentation now over to Paul Napoli to talk about what he's seen in New York State and around the country. Paul? Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Richard. Um, Steve and Richard covered a, a lot of a lot of information, and I, I want to try to um, be a compliment to what they say. Everybody should understand that these plafluorinated substances, also known as fluorosurfacants, are not naturally occurring substances. Prior to them being invented back in the early 1900s in a laboratory of 3M in Minnesota, no one really, they were not on the face of the earth. So having been developed by 3M, uh, there are now approximately 4,000 different types of perfluorinated substances or fluorosurfacants. And they've been used in almost uh, anything you can think of. And Richard talked about a few of them. Some of those 4,000 chemicals uh, have come to the top of the list of concern, not because they're necessarily the most concerning of the 4,000, but they're the ones we know the most about. So there's probably going to be, in the next few years or decade, more that we learn about the other fluorosurfacants that's also going to become a problem. And if you think about uh, fluorosurfacants, the two most prominent are PFOS, which you'll hear a lot about in New York from the DEC and from different state agencies. And PFOS was made by 3M. And it is uh, also known as Scotchgard. So PFOS, S for Scotchgard. And that was used in a variety of products, as Rich said, in, in, in fabrics and carpets and furniture. And the second big ticket fluorosurfacant that's been a major concern that we know the most about is PFOA. And that movie that Richard talked about, The Devil We Know, was about PFOA, and that is a DuPont product. And that is also commonly known as Teflon. And Teflon was not only used in frying pans, but it was used in industry and by a lot of different industries, pump manufacturers, all sorts of things, brakes, different products that are in a lot of our communities used by a lot of manufacturers PFOS and PFOA is used in, in metal plating to keep the fumes down when they're plating so there's no bubbles in, in the chrome or in the plating. So there is a variety of industries that have uh, used these products. And when ultimately what 3M and DuPont, who are the two main manufacturers, uh, told local industry was really nothing. So when it came to throwing away their waste or their byproducts or bringing them to the uh, landfill, they didn't do what the manufacturer now recommends you do with any type of PFOS or PFOA product. What they recommend is the wastewater treatment facility not take the product and put it in their normal course, but actually incinerate it at 1200 degrees or greater. And not many, if any, uh, wastewater treatment facilities in New York have that ability. There are only a few around the country. And science is not really certain that that even solves the problem. So you've had from the early 1900s when the products were developed 
to now a collection of these as they became more and more common in use put into the landfills. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, go to the one before it. I'm looking at my slides. Uh, before, please, before, yeah. So this is a list of the chemical companies, many of them are billion dollar companies that are, are producing thousands and thousands of tons of these products a year. I think I saw an estimate the other day that 3M alone produced 249 million tons of it last year, um, and DuPont. So there's a, a, a huge amount of this product being used, but these on the left side are the manufacturers of the chemical itself, PFOS and PFOA. Uh, 3M also has a PFOA product, and on the right side, is manufacturers of firefighting foam. That is what's been getting the most attention, and that is right now, which is subject to a lawsuit against these manufacturers in federal court in, in Charleston, South Carolina. And the product was used in firefighting foams because it would suppress the vapors in putting out jet fuel fires or any type of fuel fires. And uh, in utilizing it, they put in three to six percent in the product, but it would of course run into the waste, uh, into the ground, and eventually into the drinking water. And that's the biggest concern uh, from the Department of Health, from all of us, and legally is what this is doing to the drinking water because. The devil we know, in that case, that was a DuPont case in Parkersburg, uh, West Virginia, uh, taught us that there are cancers caused by these chemicals. So it's, it's, it's a minute amount is enough to cause cancer, and that's why there's a, a growing concern. Next slide, please. Um, where was AFFF used? You know, the main airports that it was used uh, initially was the Air Force bases and wherever there was an Air Force base. But ultimately, probably in the mid-70s, the FAA required AFFF foam be used at all civilian airports as well. And it was used not only if there was a fire, but it was also used in training at those airports, so wherever you have a fire training at an airport, it was used to practice weekly or monthly by the local firefighters. And in New York, every county, for the most part, has a fire training center. It was also used at those fire training centers. So those are other sources of potential contamination of the PFAS and PFOA. Some some facilities actually collected some of the fluid and gave it to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, others might have thrown their empty buckets out and it may have ended up in the landfill. A single bucket of this type of AFFF foam can contaminate tens of millions of gallons of water. So there is a potential uh, source of problem in almost every landfill around the United States, not only because of firefighting foam, but all these common and everyday use products. And where you're seeing this on the map, uh, these spots is, is only a piece of it, it's only AFFF. If we overlay on landfills and fire training centers and, and industry, the, the whole United States will be covered. And where you're seeing it the most, like New York and Long Island and down the East Coast in California, are really the places that have either been started testing for it themselves on a statewide basis or have been testing for it at the federal level because the federal government has now required all Air Force bases to look. And out of the 200 or so Air Force bases that they've surveyed, they found um, AFFF or PFOS and PFOA contamination above the health advisory limit in a large number of them. 
and have found contamination at some level in almost every single one of them. So this is a pervasive problem. Next slide, please. So you can you can see from this map, uh, and and it's even evolved from the time that I put this slide together a, a few weeks ago, that states are starting to realize that they have big concerns, and as they're starting to realize and put these regulations in place, they are starting to look for the sources of that contamination. And and I know when I began working on these cases. Two years ago, we believed at first the only source was going to be the airports where the fire training foam was used. Since that time, we've 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 heard uh, every sort of story and learned that there are multiple sources. And so the the list is 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 a short list by category, but it's, it has a big impact. So airports have started on the list. Then we had um, wastewater treatment plants. We learned about that in, in, in Maine. We were called by a water provider and they had uh, unusually high PFOS contamination and they traced back the contamination from the well to a organic farm that was down the block from the wastewater treatment plant who got biosolid uh, from the from the excuse me drinking water plant? Who got biosolid from the wastewater treatment plant? And so, and the wastewater treatment plant received uh, um, waste from a paper mill. So the paper mill, which PFOS and PFOA are used in paper processing, gave the contaminants to wastewater treatment. Who gave the biosolids to the farm? and it ended up in the drinking water. And now we're seeing more and more uh, different states starting to look at, at landfills and industry associated uh, in, in, in neighborhoods. So landfills are definitely on the radar of, of states and, and looking for sources. And so you should be aware, like we have in New York, you're gonna expect to see the state come to you and ask you for more and more testing. And that testing is, is difficult. I was with a, um, a someone who, who collects, been collecting PFOS water samples for water districts on Long Island the other day. And he's gotten some false results and they, and they learned, because this is really cutting edge, he learned that the reason they got false results was there was duct tape around the faucet that they were collecting the samples from and that was a likely cause of a of a false positive at the water district so you have to be really careful in doing any type of testing uh, next slide please and i think we're running out of time so I, I i will tell you a little bit about what's going on uh on the state federal and local uh, level and, and legislation. New York is probably one of the most advanced uh, states in the country, um, making sure that we have a, a, a notice level and an MCL level, and that MCL level is in the final process of being put in place for, for PFAS and PFOA, and, and we believe that'll be put in place within the next year. It has, it has passed and been, and been signed on to. Uh, there are other states following suit. We've started with uh, regulations four or five years ago that were at 400 parts per trillion, and we've seen them go from 200 parts per trillion to 70 parts per trillion at the federal level as a health advisory limit. And But the states doing risk assessments have been coming in at lower levels, and we believe ultimately the state and eventually the federal government will come in not at 10 parts per trillion or five parts per trillion, but potentially at non-detect because of all the health studies that are going on 
around the country and around the world finding all sorts of linking between kidney cancer, pancreatic cancer, ulcerative colitis, and a number of, 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 of other um, illnesses, and the list keeps growing. Um, I think, Steve, I think that's a good place for me to conclude in, unless you'd like me to speak about something else. can uh, can use to assist in uh, in understanding and investigating uh, potential contamination um, in their community, whether it be in manufacturing, uh, uh, firefighting foam around airports, uh, and as we've learned from Rich and you in landfills. Uh, we do have a few minutes here. We are over our hour time by a few minutes. Uh, we did have a, a question, a couple of questions come in. I'll take a few of them. Again, if you have questions, please uh, submit them and we can uh, um, pick them up. One of the questions is uh, uh, maybe for Rich, uh, where where should I go to learn more about PFAS? Uh, or Paul, I know that you have uh, PFAS information. Let's go to Paul Napoli first. Uh, how, how do folks learn more about PFAS? Well, our office has a lot of materials on PFAS. It, it's literally changing week to week with different types of environmental studies and publications and peer-reviewed articles coming out, about, out. But you could also go and visit the EPA website or the New York State uh, Department of Health website and, and, and DEP, and they have a lot of information about um, PFAS and PFOA. Okay. Uh, Rich, uh, another question here. What is the expected timeline for the new regulations from the state, DEC, DOH? Um, I don't know if I can really answer that, to be honest with you. I imagine they're, okay. they're going to be forthcoming, but uh, I, I don't think I can answer on, on that. Okay. Um, what I know about that is we do expect them by the end of the year to become finalized and implemented within the first quarter of 2020. Uh, the state is currently reviewing about 5,000 comments that have come in on these regulations, and they are processing those comments, questions, and concerns right now, and uh, leading towards implementation uh, in the first part of uh, first quarter of 20, 2020. Um, we've heard a lot about PFOA and PFOS. Are there uh, should folks be concerned about other PFAS related? Uh, chemicals. Uh, we'll go to Paul first, and then Rich for that answer. You, you know, what I've learned over the years in working in environmental litigation is once you think you've solved one problem uh, with dealing with one chemical or one concern, another one seems to pop up. So I, I've gotten jaded, and 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 I believe. There, like I said earlier, I think there are going to be more that we learn about over time. I don't think that any of them are going to be good to, to make our way into the drinking water. So we have to be concerned about it and do whatever we can to protect the groundwater and drinking water be, from being infiltrated from, from any type of leachate because inevitably somebody's going to find out something bad about it and it's going to end up being a concern or a problem that's going to cost you know, the landfills or cost us. Rich? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I would imagine. Um, I know in that movie that I referenced in the beginning there, they um, talked about how the uh, chemicals that were used in Teflon were, you know, were discontinued and they switched over to uh, something called Gen X. And, um, you know, but a lot of the, the questions about Gen X uh, were, were very similar to the questions that, that we're talking about for the, for the, for the PFOA and the PFAS. So, um, yeah, I would absolutely, with technology uh, improving um, and these man-made chemicals being throughout the environment, I would imagine this is going to be the type of thing that, um, you know, we have to deal with in the future. Okay, um, we, uh, we uh, have a couple of other questions that we'll, we'll try to take maybe uh, just a few more um, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have to wrap up. But 
but uh, um, from the first presentation, uh, it appeared that that the contamination at PFOA, PFOS were banned in the United States. Are they still in use? So, Paul, I'll take a crack at that and turn it over to you. The answer to that is yes. I believe they start, they still are in use and uh, are actively used in the industrial sector, as well as firefighting foam. Uh, as far as I know, Paul, the federal government has not eliminated the, uh, the use of this foam uh, per se, uh, but uh, can you answer that question? Are these products still in use in the United States or are they banned? So there are many products in the United States that still contain PFAS and PFOA. In 2000, 3M stopped producing it in the firefighting foam. They were about 85% of the market. And so what happened is the other manufacturers on the list came in and filled the void with other fluorosurfacants that have the same problem. They're all C8 carbon-8 atom um, fluorosurfacants. And so it, it is a problem. And you have to remember in New York, depending on what part of New York you live in, we're, we're drinking 15 to 35-year-old water by the time it gets to our drinking water and percolates down through the groundwater. So a lot of these problems are hitting that the height now. Um, okay. Uh, Rich, uh, your thoughts. Uh, shouldn't the state require labeling requirements on products that contain PFAS? Wouldn't it be a good idea for the state to uh, pass legislation so that the public can be can become more aware, or even the federal government? Uh, really, it's the United States Congress. Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, absolutely. I I was in uh, a store this weekend uh, with my daughters, and I was uh, stopped by the cookware section, and I noticed that um, there were labels on some of the nonstick cookware that said. Uh, you know, PF, PFAS free, um, PFOA free, and uh, but I noticed that it wasn't that label wasn't on all the nonstick cookware, and uh, it just got me nervous about uh, you know what are, does that mean that the, the other nonstick cookware continues to to use these chemicals? Um, but yeah, absolutely, I think um, you know somebody should be responsible for letting consumers know. Um, before they they start using these these products, if there's if there's the concerns about the health risks that there are. Yep. Follow up to that, Rich. Is a municipal transfer station required to test their drinking water well? Uh, for these emerging contaminants, at this point, uh, no. To not, test not. their drinking the drinking water well. The drinking water well. Um, well, I know at our at our particular transfer stations, we we either have public water or um, we provide water to people. I think you're required to test the water, but uh, I'm not I'm not 100% sure if they're testing for PFAS in uh, in in drinking water wells at transfer stations in New York State right now. If that's a, a rule or not. Um, okay, Paul, uh, is our manufacturers like 3M and Dupont uh, liable for cleanup and sampling costs at landfills and are your services uh, hourly rate charged, or how are your services procured to help with these investigations? Are you on a contingency type basis? Yes. Yeah, so we, we represent a number of counties uh, and water providers and landfills in New York and throughout the country. We charge a contingency fee, and we've been pursuing not only 3M and DuPont, but other manufacturers. And what we do is we will come in, we will survey the area with either your environmental department, we talk to the people who, who, know, who know the area, and then we go back and look at all the DEC available data and other industrial data and determine who the potential sources are and then who the potential manufacturers of the products are, that are used at those locations. And then we will bring a, a lawsuit We've ha we've had success on Long Island with a number of of water districts, but we're really at the cutting edge of this litigation around the country. I'm one of the lead appointed by a federal judge uh, out of New York. It ends up getting transferred to Charleston, South Carolina, 
We are right now in the midst of doing discovery against some of the manufacturers, but they have paid in a number of jurisdictions. They've paid the state of Minnesota uh, almost $850 million. That case that we were talking about in Parkersburg, West Virginia, they paid $650 million plus uh, to, to victims, but also to the water providers in the area and the counties to clean up the, the problem. So there is precedent for them paying. They recognize that they have a legitimate problem. And when you look at their 10Ks and 10Qs, they've budgeted tens of billions of dollars to deal with these issues because of upcoming litigation that they've anticipated and ongoing litigation. So the only way you can be able to get any type of cost recovery is you know, to file a claim. Okay, terrific. Uh, that will, uh, we're leaving Paul's uh, name up there, how you can get a hold of him. Um, we all have this material. We've had requests for the material to be made available. We'll post this on our website. Obviously, this issue isn't going away. I want to thank uh, Governor Cuomo for, again, uh, focusing on this like a laser. Our State Commission, our Department of Environmental Conservation, and our Department of Health, uh, Rich Bell, uh, Bills from Steuben County, and all of you uh, for attending this session. You'll hear much more about this from NISAC as we go along uh, over the next several years. And thanks again for joining us today. Thank you.